Hello, this is the second video in a series on the novel Wide Sargasso Sea and in this video we're going to look at the character Antoinette um, and just have a bit of an introduction to her um, in the novel. Uh, make sure you're taking notes as you're watching this and I've put the Cornell note-taking template here on the side. So pause the video, draw the template and then let's get ready to go. The first question we might want to ask is who is Antoinette Causeway in the novel? Well, in Jane Eyre, Antoinette is known as Bertha. Um, she's a mad woman in the attic. And Rochester in that novel has renamed his wife, giving her a more English identity and asserting his control over her selfhood. If you don't know much about Jane Eyre, look at the previous video to this, which explains the connection between the two novels. So in White Sock SOC, she's known as Antoinette, which is a much more French sounding name. Um, and that's the name that she prefers to be called by until Rochester starts calling um, her Bertha about halfway through Wide Sargasso Sea. Antoinette's mother um, is called Annette, she's from Martinique, and in the first couple of lines of Wide Sargasso Sea, she's described as being pretty like pretty self. She's extremely beautiful um, and she's also very much aware that her beauty is the key to the survival of her family. So when the novel begins, her first husband has died and she needs to marry again in order to get that financial stability for them. Antoinette's younger brother is called Pierre and um, he has cerebral palsy and Annette devotes most of her time to his care. Christophine um, is also one of the key characters in the novel, um, part of this family unit. She's the family slave, um, or she was the family slave um, before the Emancipation Act. Again, watch the previous video to find out about that. She's also from Martinique um, and she was a wedding present to Annette from her husband. Christophine has connections with the supernatural and practices obeyer. So Antoinette at the start of the novel is very isolated. There's a, a small um, family unit around her, but even within that, um, because Annette is so um, concerned with looking after Pierre, even within that family unit, Antoinette is very isolated. Um, and the whole family themselves are isolated from the rest of the community. So the very first line of the novel is, they say when trouble comes, close ranks, and so the white people did, but we were not in their ranks. And she's also called a white cockroach by some of the former slaves in the novel. And that first line, that pronoun they, is so simple, but it echoes throughout the entire novel as a motif which suggests that there are different um, racial groups here, different um, gender groups, different um, hierarchies in terms of social class. And Antoinette doesn't feel like she's any part of those groups. And so she's always referring to groups of people as they, separating herself from them. And then that we, that pronoun in the second sentence there, um, is her identifying herself with her mother and her brother as well there. Um, Antoinette also feels marginalised in the novel. She says she got used to a solitary life. So separate from the people in Spanish town, um, separate from the former slaves, um, and separate really um, in her own little world at the beginning of the novel. Um, Antoinette is also presented as being very innocent. Um, she describes at the beginning that our garden was large and beautiful as that garden in the Bible. And there's kind of a couple of different types of innocence here. I suppose, firstly, her lack of understanding and knowledge of um, kind of religious culture shows, um, I guess, kind of educational innocence. Um, but also the fact that she's in this garden, almost like Adam and Eve themselves at the start of the, the Bible. Antoinette is in this garden, largely on her own, um, experiencing um, the natural world. Antoinette is also very unaware of the world around her, and this is signaled symbolically um, in the first part of the novel. Um, she talks about um, a particular plant in the garden, the orchid, which was a bell-shaped mass of white, mauve, deep purple, wonderful to see. I never went near it. Um, there are definitely sexual connotations here, um, and the fact that Antoinette never went near this, she seems quite afraid of that aspect of life. Um, which is very different to the character of Bertha that we meet in Jane Eyre. Antoinette is also very insecure and the only place that she feels safe in during these opening pages is the garden. I mean, the whole island, the whole world is going into chaos around her. There's lots of conflict to do with the um, Emancipation Act and how people are going to find that there are places in this new society. Um, and Antoinette feels safe at home, but not in the house, which would be a symbol of the colonial power but in the garden, in the natural world. 
So she says, when I was safely home, I sat close to the old wall at the end of the garden. I never wanted to move again. And she really wants to retreat there and be on her Right, Antoinette versus Bertha then. So Antoinette and Wilde Sargasso see, as I said, until about halfway through when Rochester starts calling her Bertha and she's called Bertha all the way through Jane Eyre. And one of the key questions is, why is she presented in this way at the start of the novel? Why is she presented as being innocent and unaware and naive? Well, firstly, Reese is challenging the narrative of Jane Eyre in which Bertha is a, she's predatory, she's mad, she's violent, but above all, she's villainous. It's her who's been part of this trick to ensnare Rochester into a marriage that isn't any good for him. In uh, Bronte's novel, she's described as looking like the foiled German spectre, the vampire. So she's almost completely dehumanised. She's presented as being supernatural um, and she tears Jane Eyre's uh, wedding veil in half. She attacks um, people and draws blood and so on. Um, so she's a very animalistic figure. Whereas in the opening pages of Wild Sargasso Sea, we see a completely different kind of character. What we see here is an innocent victim of a chaotic colonial society, a young girl who's stranded in a world that she doesn't understand and that she has to learn to navigate whilst the people around her are acting um, for their own good and no one really seems to care about her. From a post-colonial perspective, um, Reese is exposing how colonisation wasn't simply a process of taking people's land and their rights. In many parts of the world, it resulted in the silencing of alternative voices. So the voices of the colonised people, um, for example, um, the voices of anyone who was kind of between two cultures. And we remember that Antoinette is uh, uh, described as a Creole in the novel. Um, and also the misrepresentation, the dehumanising, the stereotyping of the other. Um, and so at the start of the novel, um, Antoinette is also looking at the characters around her, so Christophine, for example, and trying to discover their real story. What is their, their voice? What is their narrative? And how can that challenge the kind of almost monolithic narrative of the colonised people? Um, and Antoinette tries to discover this, as I said, through Christophine and also through her friend Tia that we meet in the first part of the novel. From a feminist perspective, then, Rees also explores how the patriarchy engages in similar processes. And of course, the patriarchy is very closely linked with um, the idea of colonisation um, because it would have been the, the men who engaged in that colonising process. In Jane Eyre, we only hear Rochester's male account of Bertha's life. It's a very clearly biased account. It's entirely from his perspective. We never hear Bertha say anything intelligible. Um, and what we see in Jane Eyre, or sorry, in Why Sargasso See at the beginning, is this um, alternative voice. It's the female voice being able to describe her own experience and therefore challenging um, that monolithic male narrative of how the world is supposed to work. So what did Jean Rees say about Antoinette? Well, in her biography, um, she writes this about her. When I read Jane Eyre as a child, I thought, why should she think Creole women are lunatics and all that? What a shame to make Rochester's wife, Bertha, the awful mad woman. And I immediately thought I'd write the story as it might have been. She seemed such a poor ghost. I thought I'd try and write her a life. And there's quite a few things to unpick here. So. Jean Rees, um, like many of us um, in the UK, read Jane Eyre first, encountered Jane Eyre when um, she was very young. Um, and I did myself, I read, read Jane Eyre when I was a teenager and lots of people will have seen TV adaptations and so on. And it's almost as if this kind of romance between Jane and Rochester is embedded in our cultural understanding, our cultural memory. Um, and that then leads to us almost accepting that Jane has to be triumphant in the novel and for Jane to be triumphant, Bertha, the marginalised woman, has to has to die in the fire at the end of the novel. Sorry for the spoilers there. Um, and it's interesting as well that um, Jean Rees picks up on um, Charlotte Bronte's preconceptions about women from other countries. Um, so whilst Jane Eyre is a, a deeply feminist novel, a stridently feminist novel at times, um, Charlotte Bronte herself seems to have been completely blind to um, this idea of colonisation and the, the evils that that can do throughout the world. And so when Jean Rees says that um, why should she think Creole women are lunatics and so on, um, what she's doing here is, I suppose, wondering why um, a female English writer wouldn't be sensitive to um, the experience of women from other countries and from other cultures. 
um, it's interesting that as well that um, she thinks it's a shame um, that Bertha is an awful mad woman. You know, it, it's almost as if um, Jean Rhys thinks that Bronte kind of lacked imagination or lacked understanding as well. And so what Rhys is trying to do is take this poor ghost um, from Jane Eyre and write her a life, so create her a narrative and a, and a story that would lead her to that same place, but would kind of justify and explain um, the choices that Antoinette has made along the way that she's judged for in Jane and one of the questions we've got to ask ourselves, though, is whether Antoinette is actually an unreliable narrator. An, an unreliable narrator is a first person speaker in a novel who we feel we cannot trust for some reason or other. Both Antoinette and Rochester could be regarded as being unreliable narrators. So part one is narrated by Antoinette. Later sections of the novel are narrated by Rochester. And their accounts of what happened in their marriage um, have significant differences. So one of them or both of them are possibly not telling the truth or alternatively, they're telling the truth as they understand it, but not as it's interpreted by the other person in the marriage. As, as I said in the last video, it's a very postmodern novel. And so within this um, kind of world, the idea of truth almost becomes relative. What's true to one person might not be true to another. And as readers, we, we don't know which of the characters we should believe, whether we should actually believe both of them. And we need to kind of negotiate our way through this um, at times very complex and confusing um, world. However, having said all of that, by placing Antoinette's narrative first in the novel, Rhys may suggest that we should privilege her account over Rochester's. Or, at the very least, we should understand the reasons why Antoinette may not always be honest. So we see her chaotic background, isolation, the trauma she goes through, her abandonment um, in the convent, her mistreatment by others, may explain why she suffers from ment mental illness later on in the novel. Thank you for watching this video then, introducing Antoinette. In the next video, um, we're going to look at one of the other key characters in the opening of the text. We're going to look at Christophine and the subsequent videos will go through other sections of the text. Um, if you're watching this video, maybe as part of an A-level course or something, um, or you're studying the novel at university, um, here's a suggested independent learning task. Um, so I'd like you to make detailed notes in part one, using the prompts below to help. Make sure you're including um, detailed responses to the questions as well as quotations and evidence from the text. OK, thank you very much and see you in the next video.